it's uh, Roxanne Durhaj again. Welcome again to Authentic Living with Roxanne. I've been having a lot of uh, fun doing these shows, and I think this is about my seventh or eighth. So I'm getting a little bit more the hang of it. And today I have um, a very, very special uh, guest, Gary Barnes, and he's all the way out in Colorado and was uh, just so privileged. I met Gary a little while back, not too long ago, and. Um, I've spent a bit of time uh, chatting with him um, as a business coach, um, just to, you know about some of the things about being in uh, the business world, and uh, gets a lot of good things from him. So welcome, welcome, Gary. Well, thank you so much. It's a privilege being here. Awesome. So I'm going to tell. I'm going to just tell the audience a little bit about you. And um, Gary's been a business coach, a business mastery coach for how long? How long now, Gary? Well, you know, I've combined it with what I had done to build my own personal businesses, but it's over 30 years. Wow, goodness. And you have eight best-selling international Amazon books. Wow. But I just released number nine. You did? Yep. Okay. When, when did you do that? I had the boot camp last, uh, where was it? Last, not this last weekend, but the weekend before. So it's kind of wow, that's awesome. And you've... Um, dealt with clients in about seven countries. You've been on ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox, PBS, and, T and you did a TED Talk. Um, and uh, you've done some fantastic um, fun things too. Uh, you've done a 40-foot fire walk. I'm scared of those, but that, that sounds interesting. You've flown a World War II P-51 fighter. Um, you've been in a derby. Um, and you've done a bungee jump at 75 uh, feet and climbed like really, really high mountains here by the sounds of things. So you've also had a lot of fun uh, across your career. And uh, you're known for your internationally acclaimed book, How a Beaver Saved My Life. And I think I want to talk more about that. Um, and also your personal story, which I think is quite fascinating. Um, where in 1988, you were diagnosed with uh, multiple sclerosis and uh, you told you were told you had to use a wheelchair or um, that you'd be dead in, in 10 years. And we can see that that's not the case. You're very uh, alive and here with us. Um, and you didn't accept the diagnosis and you've kind of taken um, those uh, life lessons and helped a lot of other people look at... Um, you know, what is the worst day and how to captivate each and every moment. So thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to hearing all these fascinating things. Uh, I hadn't recognized the depth of some of the things that you've done in all fairness. So I'm, I'm uh, very happy to have you here today. Well, you're very welcome. You know, it, it's, conversations is what to me it's all about. It's finding out and hearing other people's stories because the story is what makes each of us unique and none of us have the same exact story. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't have permission to share that story. Absolutely. So, you know, I've had a lot of different people on. I think you're probably the second business coach. But I will, what I want to talk to you about is kind of, obviously, we, you know, you've been through a lot and you've done some amazing things out there in, in the world of coaching. But tell me when you, when you started off, what what got you into this field and what, what kind of kept you passionately connected to it to want to do these things that you've done? In the, in the coaching arena? Yeah. You know, it, it's unique because I never planned on coaching. Uh, what was happening is that people were watching me. My clients, I own one of the largest financial planning firms in the United States, where in production, I was in the top 3% of the firms. And so my clients was, they, what they were doing is watching me and they were seeing what I had been able to accomplish as a solo producer. I had three support staff, but I was the only person creating really the revenue. And so they kept asking me, hey, will you teach me what you did? You know, and, and I started running out of time. And so I started just helping people. And finally, uh, a couple of people that were referring clients to me for this told me they weren't going to send me any more clients. And I've gone, oh, gee, did I do something wrong? <laughs> it's just like, I, it hurt. And they go, yes, you're not charging them. And so I, I you know, I'm making a, quite a bit of money. Yeah, I can do this. It's in my give back. And I go, no, if you're not charging them, they're not having any skin in the game and they're not doing 
what you're giving them really great information and suggestions for. So I started out at, you know, the $50 and, you know, if you want to buy me a hamburger or, <laughs> you know, it was, it, and it's evolved. And I sold the practice 15 years ago. And after 33 years in, in the financial planning world, and it's evolved. I mean, it's taken off. I teach every thing that I teach around is what I've actually done. Some processes I've created, so they're uniquely mine. And it's not out of a book. And so I deal with companies and industries across the board from home-based businesses all the way up to manufacturing firms in the medical field across countries. Yes, I, I, I love working with people in other countries because the cultures are different and how we relate to our particular niches is different. And I think we're really becoming, or not becoming actually, we have become a world society. And so as you grow your business, I mean, look at us, we're in two different countries and, and we're communicating, we're understanding each other, we're touching lives. But building my, my coaching practice was, it really wasn't an accident. It was an opportunity that I said yes to. Wow. So you just kind of went out there and you were doing business and you were doing some good things. And then by listening again, and of course, my, my show is all about listening to that authentic space within yourself. And, you know, I know oftentimes um, most people struggle with that, right? Like, you know, I think as children, you know, and I often use the analogy of, um, you know, when I think of looking at my son, how naturally when, you know, when you have a child or your grandchildren, because I know you have uh, several grandchildren, that you, it really reconnects you with what true being is, right? Because they are so natural at following their instincts. But as we go along, you know, what happens is, you know, I, my term is we get pricked and prodded and, and, you know, and tarnished a bit. And then we get away from that authentic space. We start learning what we have been taught not to trust ourselves. You know, when we, we have our one-year-old second granddaughter uh, just turned one. And the biggest thing is walk and talk. And as soon as we walk and talk, we're told to shut up and sit down. Mm -hmm. and everybody else has what we should be doing. And we have learned not to trust that, that inner voice, that instinctive, what I call the, the little genius. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, we're really, you know, we will go to everyone and ask them what we should do. But yet, when it doesn't go right, the first thing we might say, what I hear from people is, I knew I shouldn't have done that. Then my question would be, why did you? And the simple answer is that you didn't listen to yourself. So what kind of things, you know, like you said, you do sector, you do small, you do large. When you are working with people that come to you in whatever form, how do you get them to that space? Is there an actual process or some steps that you can kind of share with, with me? I'm interested, but I'm sure everyone listening might also to help people connect, right? Because even, you know, I was talking to someone earlier this day and you know, I said, I was having this conversation. I made this decision and then somebody kind of inflected something, not on what, what you said, unlike what you just said. And I went, Oh, well maybe, maybe my instinct is not a hundred percent. Right. So I, even that happened to me earlier on this morning. So tell me a bit about how you work through that to kind of ground. I see it as grounding people in that space to really listen to what's good for their business. Well, anything you need is based in fear. And the fear is either, I call it God-given or fear that we should pay, you know, that is false fear. And what happens is that if it's something that we truly know that is not going to be good for us, that fear we need to pay attention to. But anything new produces fear because we've never borrowed or we've never been there before. And when we go into something brand new, I call it borrowed belief. Because someone has given us information, we've read it, we've intuitively thought this is something we want to do. So we're borrowing belief because we don't have an experience with the reality of the result from that action. Right. And really, it's about that. It's, uh, I, I, before the call, we were talking, I said, it's launch and adjust. And the analogy that I use is an airplane. And so I have a question for you. I'm not wanting to put you on the spot. I, I, li I like that. It's okay. okay. I can play along. <laughs> okay. So when is an airplane 100% on course? Once it's on auto, autopilot. No. no. When? 
when it's on the ground. <laughs> that is the only time. When it's in the air on autopilot, in fact, I have a number of uh, commercial uh, captain pilots that are my clients. Mm -hmm. And I asked this at my boot camp last weekend where my MC is a, uh, I, I'm not supposed to say the name of his airline, but he's a captain. And I asked him, I said, when, how often is an airplane off course using the autopilot? And he goes 99.9% .9 of the time. Oh what my goodness. What does, it does the little adjustments to bring it back on the course. Mm -hmm. But because of the wind and all of the variations, the weight, the, the things that throws us off are natural and normal. But we have a tendency to think that when we make a good decision, everything's going to be smooth. Mm -hmm. so, I wish it was. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> because we don't know what's ahead of us. And so that launch and adjust is allowing ourselves to put ourselves at risk. And when an airplane's on the ground, it's not fulfilling its destiny. Likewise, for us, if we're not moving forward, I, I remember a quote um, from um, oh the Virgin Airline guy, Sir Richard Branson. Yes. That if you're not out there far enough and it doesn't scare you, you're not out there far enough. Okay. And you you don't want to be out there so far that it paralyzes you, and we all know sometimes we will really bite out, bite off more than we can chew. The reality is is that we want to go about 110, 120 percent further than we think we can, and then take the next natural step. For sure, right? And I can think of my process um, in starting my business, and still sometimes I make decisions and I think. Oh boy. <laughs> then I think, okay, what am I going through? Because it's maybe I'm stretching myself and I'm stretching myself a bit more than maybe I was accustomed to. And then I go, you know, I have that bit of that gulp. And then I try to think, you know, what is it, what is it really about that's happening for me? Like you said, is it fear because I know I'm going to really get hurt or is it fear because I know it's like you said, unknown territory um, that I don't have those, you know, thought processes to kind of help me through it. Well, in reality, we're starting our businesses over every day. Okay. And if we're not expanding, and people, have, over the years, I've had a word every year that I've lived by. And last year I stopped, and I have used one word that I'll use for the rest of my career. And that is a word, expansion. What I'm doing is expanding what I have already built a foundation for. And when you're expanding, that doesn't mean you're doing the same things over and over again that you've done. It means that you're adding on, and you're adjusting, you're always going into new territory. So the things that we're doing, it, it, I have those same feelings. Oh, and let me give you this. I, I have a background in my early background was psychology and theology. Weird, okay, I know. Okay. And my hospital chaplaincy program, I had a mentor that gave me this, this adage that I have used throughout my career and with my coaching clients, and that is abnormal feelings in abnormal circumstances are normal. <laughs> abnormal feelings in abnormal circumstances are normal. And so when we get out of ourselves and get into an area that's new, we have all these feelings, and it's absolutely normal. It's not an indication to stop necessarily. So that's when we can stop step back and look at it, get perspective, have that input from trusted advisors, not a problem, but then making your decision because it's your journey. One of my Garyisms is life is a solo journey traveled with many. In the end, it's our own path that we have to follow. So having advisors, but at the end of the day, recognizing that you have to go back to that internal space within yourself to really kind of think about what is it that I'm trying to create? What's my voice in the world? What, what leg I often say is what, what legacy do I want to leave behind when I kind of think of my business, I think of that. And if it's kind of going off course where it's not, you know, it's, it's, you know, almost a, an opposite direction, then I, then I course, Correct. Sometimes, though, I veer off maybe a little bit further than I want to, but always coming back because then I, I kind of start to feel, I will call it the ickiness on the inside that says, oh, this doesn't feel so good. And then I, you know, try to make some change. Well, and here's a question that I've used forever for myself and with my clients 
pretty much anybody I've ever met, is that when you have an opportunity, because the more you're seeing, the more opportunities are going to come towards you. And the question is not whether this opportunity is right, wrong, good, or bad, but rather does it fit and does it match my ultimate vision? So does it take me towards or away from that ultimate vision that I've set for myself? Now the challenge is many people haven't figured out what that ultimate vision is. So they don't know. They're looking for someone else to determine what that ultimate vision is because they don't want to be wrong. And you know, wrong is, and failure doesn't live in my world. It's just a result that I didn't want or a process that didn't quite give me the result that I wanted. So what could I adjust and move again? Absolutely. So tell us, uh, tell us a bit about your uh, book, um, your original book and um, how a beaver saved my life, because I think that's an interesting story and kind of how you've, uh, how you've used it in business and how have you just kind of used it in life um, just to kind of live, live through things? Well, you know, it, it, it's an interesting story. I didn't think it was a story that anybody would ever have an interest in hearing about. And when I don't tell it at times, people bring me back to it. In 88, I was, it was just before Thanksgiving and I was shoveling snow. And basically out of one of the shovels, I had a pain in my right arm. And by that evening, I had gone numb from the neck down. I had lost all feeling from the neck down. And I didn't think there was anything wrong with it, but I went to my primary care doctor and he said, you know, virtually there was nothing he was going to be able to do for me. I was going to see the man upstairs. <laughs> kind of freaked me out because I wasn't ready to go. And he goes, oh no, you're going up to the second floor to see the neurologist. <laughs> and uh, you're cute, you know? And, um, but, the neurologist gave me three choices. Either it was a brain tumor, a cancer, or multiple sclerosis. And had one of the very first MRIs here in the state of Colorado. It was in the back of an 18-wheeler tractor trailer. And midnight, Thanksgiving weekend, doctor calls me on Sunday night. I want to see you in my office tomorrow morning. And go in, and he takes an hour to tell me everything that it wasn't. And he said, you know, finally, I, he just tell me what it is, Doc. I can take it. And he said, well, you still have three choices, MS, MS, or MS. And I went, fantastic. What can we do? And he goes, you don't understand. There's nothing you can do. This is 1988. And I said, there's always something we can do. And he goes, no, go home, enjoy your kids. My, my sons were eight and nine. And, you know, it was just one of those things. He said, you know, just prepare. This is your fate. This is your future. And um, something that I did instinctively, I have never said I had something. I've always said I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis or MS, and then it was someone else's opinion. Our brains are set up as a neutral uh, organ, if you will. Whatever you tell it, it says, okay. If you say, you know, I'm having a bad day, it's going to support that. If you say you're having a good day, it's going to support that. And, and even though I had no feelings, I lost the ability to write, to walk. If I couldn't see my feet, um, it was an interesting process. So I knew some of the things that people had done visually in visualizations. Uh, Norman Cousins used uh, the Three Stooges. He loved the laugh therapy, put himself into remission. Uh, other people used the old uh, video game Pac-Man where you know, they went and <laughs> ended up the cancer cell. Right. And it didn't really make sense to me. And so laying in bed, I was thinking about what could I visualize? And all of a sudden, an image of a beaver shows up. Now, you got to understand, my animals that I've connected to my entire life were eagles, or not were, are. And uh, in fact, you can see one of my eagles right there. Oh, wow. And, uh, and the eagle, in fact, that I had... Um, acquired that even before this diagnosis, and that title of that piece is Above the Storm. It's always quiet above the storm. You, you, so you, we have choices, where do we fly? And so I said a beaver, and he turned around and started patching up the myelin sheath, the part that dissolves around the, the nerves that you know shorts out and gives you the blockage. And I'm like, okay, cool. And so, 
next night he shows up again, next night he shows up again. Now, I got to tell you, I'm the kind of guy that if one beaver is good, more is better. <laughs> and over the next so 30 days, I created a whole army of beavers. I had three ships of beavers working around the clock. I had four of them work my payroll offices, everything to set up this company of beavers that were totally dedicated to one thing, patching up my brain. And um, then I felt a little guilty for only receiving. So then I created and expanded the visualization for parks, rec centers, shopping centers, housing, you know, everything for the beaver. So we were in this symbiotic relationship and I would spend two and a half to three hours a night in this visualization. Five years later, I had a gentleman that worked for a very large insurance company. He said, you don't act on it. And I've always said, my wife says all well, that daily. And uh, she's a psychotherapist. And the, um, I had a second MRI. What ended up happening is that the new neurologist that was uh, uh, at the MS Center here in Denver, and he had both sets of films. And he said, this is impossible because 98% of the lesions are no longer on your brain. Wow. And he goes, that's scar tissue. Scar tissue doesn't go away. And by the way, you still have, but I want to see you every six months. Well, I was in the middle of my financial planning tool. I never told anybody about this. Because people, if they think a doctor has told you you're going to be dead, they don't want to give you money. <laughs> and so it was only after I sold the practice that it started to become known. And again, I didn't think anybody would really be interested in the story. And the first book was uh, Into the Night, How or, or Into the Night, The Road from Adversity to Triumph. And it was good, whatever. And after I talked, a lady had purchased the book. And a few days later, I get this big box. And inside the box is a three-foot beaver. <laughs> and my coach at the time, I called him and I said, you never believe this. Some woman sent me a beaver. And he got so excited. He goes, when people start sending you a physical image, a physical manifestation of your story, you got to pay attention. He says, we're changing the title of the book to How a Beaver Saved My Life. Wow. Once we did that, it took me to the three syndicated shows on PBS, all the major networks. Uh, Ted X called me to do the Beaver story. I never applied. You never applied. I wow. never applied. And uh, so it, it, the, the book opened so many doors. And anyone watching this show with us today, one, if there's one thing I would tell them, write the book. Get a book out there because it opens doors for you. But the whole of Beaver Saved My Life is not a MS book. I made sure that I didn't want it to be just an MS story. Mm -hmm. I wanted it to be an adversity book. And so at the end of each chapter, I wrote an action set of all the things I did through that chapter. And so it can be applied to business, relationships, health, finances, you know, child, child raising, marital, you know, whatever. So it has the, the ability to change for whoever is wanting to, you know, embrace the dynamic, the, the technique, if you will, of what I did for myself instinctively. Um, I, I did, and this is going back to something we talked about earlier. I followed my dad. I followed my intuition of what was right for me, not what somebody else thought I should do. So it's that space within all of us. And I, I often, I mean, my book is, uh, you know, really from that perspective too, that um, the context about a lot of people get repelled in the past, right, based on what has happened, or they kind of get projected into the future, which is based on fear, right? Yeah. And oftentimes, you know, we're spending so much time on either the left or the right side that we're not completely here, which is where, where I, I hear your story being in that you took something that would have literally mentally and emotionally crippled most people, and then you said, you said something significant. You said, um, you know, I have been given a diagnosis which takes it outside of you versus um, I have MS, which means I am, right? Which is so, so significant to that concept of, of self-talk. Because if I, like to your point, 
um, you know, there's a bigger part of us listening all the time and feeding and imprinting those messages over and over again. And so in your dreams, you've got this vision and then you just started to magnify it more and more that, that things were being repaired on deep down, even on a cellular level, which is, you know, amazing that, you know, and how fascinating. So when you, when you coach people in business, do you use the concepts in the book or is it, um, a different model altogether. You know, I can't believe. And the one thing I do want to say about the, the beaver story is that I don't see it as a magic pill, a magic bean. Uh, this is my story. Mm -hmm. And I still have no feelings in my hands. I still have very little feelings in my legs and my feet. But I go to uh, hotels when I speak and they help me with my buttons. So I've learned how to adjust. But it's so much better than what it was. I've fallen off two stages. I bump into walls. And I, and it's just like, okay, but I'm still here. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, I use pieces and parts. But you said something that's critically important in my life when we first started our conversation today. And that is actively listen. I'm actively listening not only to myself, but to those that I'm with. I'm listening to you to see what's important to you, not what's important to me. And so we have a whole lot of tools and techniques and strategies in our you know, bag of tricks, if you will. But which ones are gonna be applicable, relevant to you now? And that's really the important part. I, it's not about me, it's about you. And so when we're actively listening with someone that's in front of us, they're gonna tell us, it's what I call triage. I wanna know where their pain points are. If I go into my doctor and he has a brand new shiny machine in the corner and wants all excited about telling me about it, and I go, but I'm bleeding in my shoulder, can you fix it first? I'd be more than happy to see what you're excited about. But how much of the time do we get so passionate about right. what we do and you know the things that we see that we never allow someone to walk through the door, we're wanting to pull them through the door. And I don't believe that is really our responsibility or even our right. We have to be there to be able to support and to showcase whatever it is that you and I do for our perfect client to see us as their perfect solution. So we're not selling, it's another one of my Garyisms. We do not have a mandate to sell, but an obligation to share. And those that are here in the timing well, and maybe we plant seeds, and we never know when the harvest is, but the more that we share, we know that there's a percentage of those individuals that will see us and want to connect with us. Absolutely, and you know, um, I've been doing some reading just on social media and business, and um, the one point, um, there's a book that I'm re reading, and she talks a little bit about what's in it for them, not what it, what's in it for me, because if I am, truly like you're saying just cross-pollinating and talking about authenticity and being myself and whoever's in front of me i'm captivated with whatever they're bringing um hopefully i do make a difference in their lives and then eventually people connect with you um but a lot of times in business and i'm sure you have a lot to say about social media is that a lot of people it's what's in it for me you know how many likes how many um those types of things versus saying what is it that people out there want to hear of Gary Barnes or Roxanne Durhaj, it's really, we want to know what they need in order to be able to um, help them out. It's not about us in any way. Um, we become, I, I think, collaborative, um, keeping their vision in mind and trying to figure out step by step alongside them to be able to assist them to get where they need. Yeah. One of my uh, clients is a coach that he asked me a question it was only a couple of weeks ago. And he goes, how do I convert higher numbers? And I said, well, let me ask you a question. I'm, I'm known for doing that. That's a phrase that I think we all can really relate to. I'm very Socratic. I, I want to ask questions. So the person is answering their question, not my answer. It's their answer. But I said, so what you're asking me is, how can you manipulate somebody to do what you want them to do in your timing? <laughs> What response did you get then? It was silence. He goes, oh, C-R-A-P. You know, it was like, 
<laughs> this is a heart centered, he's a seventh degree black belt. I mean, this guy is hmm. so giving. He had no reality of what he was asking, and it changed everything now. And all of a sudden, his business has exploded just into, and that was a mental shift because it isn't about us. We don't have the right to, you know, the seven tricks to convert somebody to get that no into a yes. Mm -hmm. That's so foreign to me. We don't like it being done to us. So why would we want to do it to someone else? No, and none of us like to be sold to. If we like something and um, eventually, you know, we may be kicking around for a bit, but eventually we'll come back to what we like and, and make up our own decisions, but we want the information. And I think that's what the thing is, you know, um, it's about relationship, right? If someone thinks that they're going to be able to close someone, you know, based on the funnel, you know, I'm supposed to boot, have a certain amount of people in a certain period of time, then they're losing um, track of what's important, which is eventually people will make that decision. But if they feel no emotional connection in any way, then they're not going to even consider you as an option. Well, he asked me, okay, how can I get better numbers? I said, share your story with more people. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, that's really the answer. And so you're showcasing. You're allowing the people. It, it could be the right thing for that person, but the wrong timing. We don't know. And so our job is to open the door. Their job is they have a choice to walk through. And it's always open. So now we make them aware of opportunity. So for anybody out there that maybe is in a business or, um, you know, thinking about starting a business or a coaching business or a practice or something like that. And what would be some tips, some early tips that you would give people? I, I heard one you just said, you know, just build a relationship, obviously. What, what, else, what are some things that people can actually, actually consider um, as they're kind of framing to, you, you know, begin a, a business of some sort? Well, and that's a great question, Roxanne, because most people just dive in having no idea what, you know, they're really doing. They have the concept. Uh, Stephen Covey, he really coined it, start with the end in mind. And really go out the three, five, ten years, depending upon how long you want to do that particular business. Uh, what do you want as a result for yourself? Now, that may sound contrary to what we were just talking about, but it isn't. It, it, you, if you're not part of the equation, you're not part of the solution. And so you have to make sure that that piece of it, you're including yourself in the benefit of why you're doing what you're doing. And so, but at the moment that you have that, then you can walk it back and say, okay, what does my perfect client look like? Who's my tribe? Where do they hang out? Uh, when we're dealing with social media, it's really critical. It's about relationships. And it's not social selling. Uh, one of my good friends is uh, actually it's their co-host of a syndicated radio show here. And one of the things they do is it's, they say, don't come on and say, buy my stuff. You know? <laughs> they go, buy my stuff, buy my stuff. And we're so inundated with that. It's about looking at a process that allows someone to, how can you showcase in a positive way? Another one of my Garyisms is that I am not better than, I am different from. So identify your unique talents, traits, your product, your service. Uh, I think one of the um, biggest challenges for us as uh, in any of business, and sometimes we even fall into this as we become seasoned business owners, is that we fall into the trap of telling people what we do and how we do it. They don't care. Mm -hmm. So really going beyond what is it that is relevant and what is their benefit. And so here's something else that I, I just put into a talk uh, last weekend, and it, and it came out of my coaching. I went, that's pretty good. <laughs> There's two, two word sayings. One is, so what? And so when you're explaining yourself, you're showcasing yourself, and somebody says, well, that's nice, but so what? It's a period. If we transcend and say, so that, it's a never ending plateau. And so when we're writing, we want people to say, well, if I do this, so that I can do that. And I do that, so I can do that. So it's always about them. How do they implement it? It's not just a cool idea or it's so that what for them. 
So if we start asking ourselves, okay, I have this great book with this great product, this great course, this great coaching, whatever it may be, so that now we showcase the show that. Mm. That makes the usability, we're not showing them. It's like if I go into an auto dealership, I'm an expensive driver. What do you think that my first concern or my two top concerns about buying a car? Hmm. You want me to guess again? Hopefully I get it right this time. I'm going to see um, comforts and um, safety. Okay, uh, close. I wanted to go fast and look cool. <laughs> okay, okay. Wow. So my, my express, so I have a convertible. Okay. I want it, you know, in the top down more than people realize. Yeah. I, I wanted to go fast and look cool. Right. If a salesperson brings me in and tells me all of the mechanics and the gas mileage and whatever, I hear blah, 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 gas, blah, 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 engine. I don't care. I, I mean, right. check out. they're not listening to who I am and what's important to me. And so really doing this work for ourselves up front with whatever the product or service is that we want to take to the community. And do your due diligence with the, let's say a home study course. A, a lot of people are looking at how to get into internet selling, uh, shopping carts and doing, making money while we're asleep. I don't know anyone on the circuit that creates a total program and then releases it. What we normally do is do two or three less lessons, release it, and see if our community wants it. Not that they need it, but do they want it? And then we know what the rest of it is that we can complete in the, you know, the dissemination of that product. But so much of the time we go off of what people mean or what people want. Right. Well, they, Healthcare professionals that I work with, I ask them, uh, do people want to be healthy in the United States? And they go, oh, of course they do. I go, then can I ask you a question? Why is McDonald's the number one restaurant in the United States? And they go, oh, I go, what do they really want? They want it to taste good, they want it fast, and they want it cheap. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I didn't see healthy in there at all. Right, right. Now, some of these fast food places are now showcasing they have healthy alternates. Right. They're responding to the market. But when we really look at it, is it really healthy? It's healthier. Right, right, right. Not really healthy. Not extremely healthy, but it kind of fits somewhere in the category. It so eliminate some of the guilt. <laughs> so what, what I hear you saying, though, is for people is to also think, where, what do I want? And then from that space, then go out and build or attract um, the business that you want that could also fit in your life. Because oftentimes you'll hear a lot of people say, you know, um, I value family, but then they're, they built these businesses and they're never with their family or they, you know, they value, um, you know, being at home at five o'clock, but they're in a train plane or, or an automobile because they've built this business. So it's, again, we go back to that whole concept of connection and really kind of going back to that space um, as the beginning point so that when you do build something, you are actually building it so it fits for your lifestyle, but also that you're, you're listening to your customer, um, you're understanding their needs and thinking about it. And so that, that next step would be, what can I do next to help them um, assist them along along the way. Does that make sense? It does. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it, it, virtually what I did with the coaching, because I listened to the customer and I gave them what they were asking for. So that's and a good I, point. Just listen, and then once you listen, then that gives you more information about what your marketplace is asking for. Many of my products and services now are because they have, I continue to listen. Right, and, right. You know, I, I never planned on doing certain things. Okay. So Gary, this has been a fantastic talk. I think we could probably talk for hours by the way we talk, but um, is there any last words that you would like to share um, with, with the listeners? Anything uh, that you'd like to kind of share before you go um, along with letting them know where they can uh, get a hold of you? Oh, sure. You know, my biggest suggestion is if you are in touch with a mission, a vision for yourself, launch it adjust. Take the leap, you'll be glad you did. 
one of the things that I end many times with is your worst day is you is the day you meet the man or woman you could have been. Yeah. And opportunities are around us all the time. It, it's okay. You're going to have things that don't work out. You're going to have things that work out you never planned on having them work out. And um, you know, one of the things that I never planned on doing was the boot camp. And now it's turned into a three day, you know, intensive content driven event. I do twice a year. We were talking about it earlier before right. the, the program. Uh, the next one, hey, people can check it, that out at breakthroughbusinessmastery.com. And you know, it's phenomenal. We keep the investment that comes ridiculously low. But I do it at an investment to where money does not become a challenge for people to attend. And I know that as I'm getting older, my job now is to plant seeds for trees that I will never sit under. And that, that part of it is exciting for me because we're enabling people to go out and touch others. When I was 20, I wanted to be Don Quixote, change the world. <laughs> and now I have my universe that touches your universe. And when you reached out and asked if I'd be willing to do this program with you, my immediate response is, of course. I, you know, I'm here to serve you. I'm here to serve your clients for you, you know, not, not for me to do it, but to help you expand your tribe so you have a bigger impact with people that I will never meet. Right. Uh, if people want to reach out to me, Gary at GaryBarnesInternational.com. Uh, I have everything really simple. My website is GaryBarnesInternational.com. So <laughs> all right, there. So you're right. easy to find. You're easy to find. So Gary Barnes International dot com, and uh, this has been such a pleasure, Gary. From the day I I reached out to you uh, on LinkedIn, you have been everything. Um, you're such a giving um, soul, and and um, some of the things that you shared with me, I've, I've implemented just by a conversation. So um, your your gratefulness is uh, it, it far shines you. I've, we've never met in person, but I feel like I know you. Um, and you probably will see me in July. So hopefully you've enjoyed this today. Uh, again, we talk about getting connected, being authentic, um, like uh, you know my mission is in, in the world with people. Um, so if you're liking what you're hearing from me, uh, you can go... Um, uh, and to my website at roxanderhodge.com forward slash sex. So now this gonna seem funny, but it's gonna help you get a two uh, video series that will allow you to get a lot more connected in your intimate relationships. Something that I know many people uh, are often uh, wanting a lot more. So thank you so much again, Gary, and uh, hopefully we'll see you in Colorado soon. And uh, for my listeners, we'll talk to you again next week. Take care. Roxanne, every Thursday, 11 a.m. Eastern, on Global Voice Radio.